In this lecture, we're looking at Luther and the doctrine of justification. And in this lecture, we're beginning a new wing of this course, the last third of it, where we're going to begin contrasting and comparing the doctrines of Luther and Calvin back and forth now that we have a good context of their life and we know the world that they came from as well as the impulses that drive them as individuals of the 16th century. And sometimes we're going to be putting both characters in the same lecture and comparing and contrasting a different doctrine. At times, where the doctrine is sufficiently large or important enough, we're going to separate them into two separate lectures. And in this lecture, we're going to be looking at Luther in particular on the doctrine of justification. And the importance of this is if there's any doctrine that we need to get right, it's this doctrine and Luther. Luther famously said that the doctrine of justification is the doctrine by which the church stands and falls. Now, we should go ahead and clarify this. This is one of the most overused and abused quotes ever in the history of Protestantism. This quote by Luther is often meant or implied, sometimes intentionally, sometimes unintentionally, to mean that all we really care about is the doctrine of justification, or that all Luther cared about was the doctrine of justification, as if the other doctrines are irrelevant or unimportant for the Christian life or for the believer. I jokingly refer to this as justification olatry, making the one doctrine the only thing we care about. Well, that is the furthest thing from Luther's mind. He does not believe that the doctrine of justification is the only doctrine that Christians care about. Rather, for him, this is the one that we have to get right in order for the other doctrines to make sense and to be held in their proper perspective. The church stands or falls, in other words, not on the foundation of one doctrine per se, but rather get this doctrine right, Luther says, or the church will fall and crumble into the ruins of Pelagianism. The other problem with Luther on the doctrine of justification is that too often the understanding of it at the popular level is overly simplistic and ahistorical. The Reformation is too often described as mere slogans, justification sola fide, and in the long history of Protestantism, the understanding of faith has morphed and changed at times, to the point that at times it's so out of joint from where Luther had this doctrine of justification by faith, that the waters are entirely murky and we're not quite sure where to begin. So for example, at the popular level, it can often be said when someone is asked, what do Protestants or what did Luther believe about the doctrine of justification? You might hear said back that the doctrine of justification is that Jesus forgives us or that our sins are covered through the work of Christ. The problem with this, though, is that Catholics believe these same two slogans, these same two phrases. They believe that Jesus died for our sins and that our sins are covered. Luther's doctrine of justification, in other words, belies easy categorization. While the slogans and the simple phrases are certainly good in pastoral moments where you have to communicate the gospel in very shorthand, very simple ways. But for Luther, the doctrine is enormously complex, not so much in its foundation, but rather in its application. And so in this lecture, we're going to be looking at this from the historical perspective. What did Luther actually teach on justification? And what did he believe were the results of that teaching? Meaning, what is the doctrine and how is that doctrine lived out in the Christian life? We're going to go back into Luther's context and into his writings and into the sort of full breadth of what he has to say on this doctrine in an effort to sum up what he actually believed is the doctrine of justification by faith alone. And we can begin by noting that the doctrine of justification is not so much the doctrine as to whether or not Christ forgives our sins, or the question more basically, does Christ forgive our sins? Rather, the doctrine is more focused on how those sins are forgiven in the life of the Christian. And you recall from our lectures on Luther and his context in the monastery as he sought to work out his penance, that the medieval world had taught him within the context of the monastery that the Christian life was to be a journey, that the Christian life was one of work and penance. And the fundamental root of this for Luther, the way he experienced it, the way he applied it to himself as a monk, is that he was enormously conflicted, anxiety-ridden, and fearful, not only for his life, but also for the very salvation of his soul. And whether or not Luther is fully on board with the breadth of Catholic teaching over the centuries is irrelevant here. 
In the context of the 16th century, the life that was held out for Luther, the path to salvation, entailed a great deal of work on his part. Though he had been baptized and though the Holy Spirit had come into him, according to Catholic doctrine, it was his job to continue to affect within his own soul, through penance and confession and all these things, the care and nurture of the grace that had been infused into his heart. And that key word there, infused, is really the knot of the problem. In the Catholic system, of course, one is infused. One receives grace internally. Grace is a thing. It has a substance, a being to it. And that grace comes into the believer at the moment of baptism. The goal of the Christian life then for Luther, as a monk, as a Catholic, was to work out his calling. Now, the doctrine that is in play here, or at least the way this doctrine is lived out in Luther's life, is really a combination of a couple of forces. Of course, in the backdrop, the foundational principle of all Catholic and Protestant doctrine on the subject of grace and forgiveness comes from the man Augustine. Now, of course, Catholics and Protestants disagree as to how to interpret Augustine. But Augustine began with this idea that salvation is unmerited grace. We cannot save ourselves. Christ came down. He died the death that we all deserved. And therefore, the grace of God is covering us in some way. And so the Catholic system in the Middle Ages, flowing out of this, and Augustine's own teachings, have at root this fundamental conviction that God's grace is the covering for our sins. There were, however, two impulses or two perspectives, one from Augustine and one from the Middle Ages, that began to apply the understanding of God's grace and his forgiveness over us in a way that began to lead down some paths that Luther does not like. Within Augustine's theology, the basic principle comes from a Platonic ideal. And what Augustine basically lands on is the idea that Christ has done the work, but that within us there is planted the love of God, the desire for him. And, Augustine would say, that desire isn't just unto itself a sort of generic love. Rather, in a platonic sense, the love that you have draws you towards the object of your love. So, in the Christian life, you love God, you have been given the grace of baptism and the grace of forgiveness in the work of Christ, and now infused with that love, drawn towards God, as the Christian life progresses, Augustine will say, there is a change that is wrought in the person. They become more like the object of their love and less like they were. It's a natural phenomenon, you might say, even though it is, of course, supernatural, because the love is given by God himself. And it's that understanding of love that allows Augustine to say, on the one hand, that grace is entirely unmerited. We did not earn our salvation. But on the other hand, as the Christian life progresses, he'll say, there is a change that is wrought in the person. Well, what happens over the Middle Ages in general, and this is as broad as it gets, and unfortunately this is going to leave a lot of complexity to the side, but as the Aristotelian understanding of virtue begins to work its fingers into the minds of medieval theologians, what begins to happen is the idea becomes more prevalent, again, highs and lows, different people emphasize different things, but the idea becomes that the virtue that we have within us, the grace that is infused in baptism, is something that we nurture and care for on our own. In other words, it can sound very similar within the medieval system, based on the Augustinian principles. In many ways, what they're saying is the same verbiage, that we are drawn to God and we change during that drawing, that wooing by God the lover of our souls. However, as the meditation and the reflection on virtue carries on through the Middle Ages, by the time you get to the latter Middle Ages and into Luther's context within the 16th century, what has happened is the doctrines themselves have morphed or mutated a bit to the point where now virtue and the good has synced up with this idea of merit, that the Christian is covered by Christ's sins, but that they have to achieve some level of merit in order to atone or pay for or to crush the desire within the soul for sin.
The goal is to extol virtue, to practice the habits of grace, and strengthen those virtues, and to deny and to mortify the sin within. And given all of this sort of context and this backdrop, you could easily see how this could get off the rails. In a manner of speaking, the latter Middle Ages in particular, though it's there in the high Middle Ages as well, began to focus too much on the doctrines of merit to the exclusion of the covering of Christ and the unmerited grace that was so dominant in the teachings of Augustine. So now we come down to Luther himself. He has his breakthrough, he has read Romans 1, and he comes now to a new understanding, he believes, a biblical understanding, he believes, as to the doctrine of justification. Well, there are a couple of things we have to say about this to understand what Luther means by this. First and foremost, Luther believes that the doctrine of justification is forensic and historical at the same moment. Strictly speaking for Luther, and this is true, frankly, of all Protestant doctrine on the subject of justification, strictly speaking, our justification is not at the moment of faith. We are not justified by faith in the sense that we create our justification because we have faith. It is not the case that Protestants believe that we have avoided all this talk of good works or merit or penance or any of these things, and we've just exchanged it for one great work of faith. That faith is somehow how God loves us because we have the faith. We are not creating our justification, Luther and other Protestants will say, but in particular Luther, by our faith. Rather, Luther will say our justification is on the cross. It's historic. It happened. God came down took on human flesh, and in the context of his perfect righteousness, he died on the cross as the effectual atonement for the sins of the world. Luther will say that is our justification, what Christ has done on the cross, and that cross is victorious because Christ was resurrected from the dead. No resurrection, and it's just simply another man up on the cross like so many during the Roman world. But because Christ is the victorious sacrifice, God come down, the atonement for us. That moment, the cross itself, is our justification, Luther believes. Now, the root problem, of course, is because Christ has achieved justification, because it is external to us, because it is not our own work, but the work of Christ, the fundamental problem for the Christian is how do we receive that justification? It's out there, it's far away, it is in the person of Christ, but it needs to be applied, we would say, to us. Well, the way it is applied, Luther believes, reading Paul in the book of Romans and others, is solely, only, entirely by faith. Meaning faith, again, is not the thing that creates our justification, it's the thing that grabs our justification. It is the instrument, we say, in systematic theology that grabs hold of Christ. He is the justification. He has achieved the atonement. And since it is alien to us, his righteousness is not our righteousness. What we need is a way to grab it, to hold on to him. And the way Luther gets at this, and the way he describes it so very often, is he describes it in terms of the promise, the promise of the gospel. Luther says that in the gospel, there is offered the promise that Christ has died for our sins, and that all we have to do is to believe that promise. And for Luther, that is the context, the essence of faith. Believing that someone has died for you, this man Jesus, and that his work is sufficient. There are all kinds of wonderful quotes from Luther about how we are simply to grab onto Christ, to hold on to him. He is the rock, and the crags in the rock are where we grab onto by our faith, saying, I am unjust and I need him. So, when Luther says that we are justified by faith alone, he is not saying, again, that our justification is somehow insufficient without our faith. Our faith doesn't actually add anything to justification. Justification is accomplished in the work of Christ. Rather, it is something that grabs hold of it. Now, what is the result of this in Luther's doctrine? Well, the way Luther plays this out in the Christian life is the most important factor in Luther's understanding of justification. It is, in fact, the most idiosyncratic way of any of the other Protestant teachings. Luther has a couple of concepts and preaching methodologies and pastoral methodologies about the way the life of justification is lived out. 
that again are somewhat unique to him. They're unique sometimes just simply by the way he sloganizes it, but they're also unique in terms of the way that he applies it to the life of the everyday Christian believer. And I think probably the better way to go at this is to talk about some of the misconceptions about what Luther believes, and then discuss the way Luther actually teaches the Christian life ought to be conducted. First and foremost, Luther does not believe that justification or the moment of faith is a particular once-for-all, let's say, sinner's prayer, walk-the-aisle moment. For most Protestants and most evangelicals coming out of the North American scene, following the Great Awakenings and the conversionism that so many of us are heirs to, too often what happens is we believe that the Protestant understanding of justification for all of us is a moment where we accept the gospel. Now, Luther, of course, is very much in favor of this in the main. He's not opposed to conversion, per se. We are talking about a man who had a breakthrough, a real pivot in his life where suddenly he embraced the gospel. But for Luther, the concept of the way that we embrace our understanding of justification and embrace our faith is an ongoing, never-ending struggle throughout the Christian life. Now, the struggle is not for repentance or penance or for some merit or work on our own behalf. Rather, it's the opposite. For Luther, in the moment of the preached word, when the gospel is preached, you have two moves, two actions that happen. You have the preaching of the law, and then you have the preaching of the gospel. Now, law gospel here is not Old Testament, New Testament in that sense. Rather, for Luther, the law preached is the thing that terrorizes us. We hold up the law. We hold up the commandments. We discuss the required perfection of the covenant that God has made all throughout the centuries of humanity, where he says you must live up to this standard. And that being the law, we are terrorized, and being terrorized, feeling insufficient, we then hear the gospel. We hear the good news. Christ has paid it all. You simply have to believe that his justification is sufficient, even for right now, the moment that you again feel terrorized by the law. In other words, for Luther, the goal of preaching, the pastor's responsibility, is to always, always, always preach law gospel, law gospel. And this concept of law gospel is more fundamental. It's more rooted in the essential psyche of every human being. Some of us, of course, can appreciate the fact that not everyone feels a terrorized conscience. Sometimes we feel arrogant. But deep down, in the core of our being, we know that there is something inadequate, something unlovable. The Christian life, in other words, for Luther, is not a once and for all moment of justification, but rather a reapplication of the doctrine of justification by faith again and again and again in the Christian life. We are constantly terrorized, then we hear the promises of God, that he has paid it all, and then we rest secure. We cease from our labors, from our merit, from our works. So the goal for the Christian life, for Luther, is not easy believism. And in a manner of speaking, it's not conversionistic either. Though he does believe in conversion, though he does believe that there's a moment where one can begin the process of the Christian life by first embracing the fact that Christ paid it all for us, we don't simply then sit back and say, well, I have been justified. Hooray! Let's go on with the Christian life and find something to do before I get to heaven. The Christian life, in other words, is always a struggle for Luther. It's always being terrorized, always then having to believe. Secondly, and very importantly, the terror in the Christian life is not Satan and it's not hell. Rather, it's God himself. And this is one of the elements of Luther's theology that is idiosyncratic, and it's one of the issues that sometimes people raise as a problem they have with Luther's doctrines. For Luther, it's not Satan, it's not sin, it's not hellfire and damnation that is to terrorize us. Rather, for Luther, again and again and again, and this is true for all Lutheran theology ever since Luther died, the terror, the fear is towards God himself. He is a just God. He is a righteous God. He has wrath for sin. And so therefore, in the context of the law, God is the righteous, angry judge. You'll recall that Luther said in the monastery that he actually hated God. He was angry at him. Here he was trying his best, and he was not living up to it. Well, that reality does not cease when Luther converts or when he has his breakthrough. 
Luther is clear on this. Pastorally, the law preached is of a terrorizing, fearful, vengeful God. Not in the sense of him being evil, but in the sense of in our soul, we realize just how much we deserve the wrath of God for our sin. It's not Satan. For Luther, Satan's job is not to terrorize us, but rather to trick us. To trick us into not believing the promise of the gospel, that Christ has paid it all, and that therefore God is a loving God towards us because we have been covered. That relationship between Luther is fundamental as we go in through the next several lectures, when we look at Luther on the third use of the law, etc. Within Lutheran theology, there is a fundamental push to say, when considered from the vantage point of our own sin, from that existential reality, looking out and seeing how much we have fallen short, God is not gracious and loving in a tender, hallmark card, sweet grandpa in the sky who is there to simply dote on us and love us. Rather, when the law is preached, we hear vengeance, we hear wrath. And so therefore, it is only in the context of the gospel, only in the context of hearing that promise and being reminded, ah, yes, he died for me. It is covered. I am fine. The promises are for me. They're not out there. They're not far away. They do not belong only to Christ, but they are for me as well. Thirdly, Luther believes that the reality of this Christian life is lived out in the sacramental function of the liturgy of the church. Now, this is where most evangelicals who are in favor of Luther's understanding of justification differ so much with Luther himself and with Lutheranism over the centuries. Again, for Luther, it's not simply resting on the promises and then going about your everyday life and simply hearing sermons again and again and again. Rather, for Luther, there is the reality that we need Christ, we need him And therefore, it is in the context of baptism and the Lord's Supper and the liturgy of the church itself where we hear repeatedly the law and the gospel and the promises that are for us. And we'll actually see this when we discuss Luther's understanding of the sacraments. One of the reasons why Luther is so committed, so zealous to the idea that Christ is physically in the sacrament is because he believed we need Christ. We need to be partakers of him. And without that, we are lost. The promise has to be applied to us because it is alien to us. Lastly, for Luther, this reality of justification, because it is an ongoing reality, and because he has rejected the fundamental idea of virtue from the Middle Ages, he has rejected that, in fact, almost entirely, Luther has a real allergy to any discussion that focuses overly much on our works, our experience, or our faithfulness. Now, again, This flies in the face of so much of how Lutheranism is applied to those who are not Lutheran, those who embrace Luther's doctrines, but embrace it maybe in a context that is of a different denominational stripe. What ends up happening for some is they begin with this idea that justification is a moment, it is conversion, and Luther believes too often what happens is when we believe that justification is a punctiliar moment that happened once, the rest of the Christian life tends to fall back into this concept of How am I getting on with the rest of the Christian life? How am I changing as a result of that one-time, once-for-all justification? But because Luther actually believes that the Christian life is lived out in the context of the sacraments and the ongoing law gospel preaching, the terror of my insufficiency and then believing the promise week by week by week, for Luther, as he says in a slogan, we are simul justus et peccator, at the same time justified been yet a sinner. For Luther, the fact of the Christian life is that we do not really change all that much at all. Now, this doctrine is usually overplayed. Luther doesn't believe that there is no change. Rather, he believes that the change is of such a minimal quality and achieved, frankly, by no effort whatsoever on our part, that to focus on it is to put the cart before the horse. Towards the end of his life, Luther will actually change the slogan somewhat and end up saying that we are semper justus epicator always justified in sinner. Now, what's at root of this, again, is a fundamental rejection of the idea of virtue in the Christian life. Here, Luther is saying, our justification, our righteousness, is not a part of us in the sense that we have somehow infused ourselves with grace through baptism and through the Lord's Supper, and that we therefore activate this through the habit and the practice of merit and penance, etc. Rather, Luther says, 
the entirety of the Christian life is lived in the same context fundamentally as when we first believed. We are still that same sinner. We have not fundamentally changed. We still have cankers in our heart that draw us to our own self-love, our own self-worth, until we hear again, week by week, the law preached, the terror of that, the sense of wrath and the judgment that we are owed. And then again, we hear that gospel preached. And we are reminded that Christ has paid it all. And it's for all these reasons combined, frankly, that Luther does not believe in easy believism or cheap grace. The Christian life is a struggle. It's a struggle to stop the anxiety and to halt the process of us trying to achieve our own merit or sanctification. Or, put another way, to believe that our sanctification is the ground of our acceptance in Christ. Far from cheap grace, Luther believes that this struggle to always rest in the promise and not in our own work is something that is so easy to forget, something that is so fundamental to all of us to fall back into our own self-righteousness, that it takes hard preaching and a real serious struggle to always, always, always remind ourselves of just how insufficient we are before the throne of God, and therefore, when we hear that promise and we believe it, it is actually sweet news to our ears. Okay, that's it. Next, we're going to look at Calvin on this same doctrine, the doctrine of justification. Mm-hmm.